all I do. Um, I was talking to Mark the other day I, about a book review that I did of Jeremy Halleck's book on evidence-based medicine. I was looking it up to make sure that I remembered what I said. It turns out it came out actually six years ago this month, which is really frightening. Um, and at the end of that review, I was complaining that Jeremy uh, was taking a tactic that the defenders of EDM generally take, where they point to all of the other terrible things that have been done in the past, and um, that uh, you know clearly the critics of evidence-based medicine want to go back to the bad old days of leeches and authority. And I said that this was a lot like Churchill's defense of democracy. You can prove from this that EBM is the worst form of medicine that's ever been practiced, except for all of the other ones. Um, but that that actually isn't incompatible with us developing an even better way of doing medicine. So I, I think that this talk is an effort to contribute to that kind of improvement of EBM. Uh, so what I'm going to do is divide the talk into two main parts. Uh, part one is actually a little bit longer. It's the setup. I want to discuss how the, de the relationship between evidence-based medicine and mechanisms has occurred, starting with the EBM literature itself, <coughs> and looking at two approaches in the literature on philosophy of medicine, one of which I call the either-or approach, which is uh, Jeremy Hallett and Holly Anderson, and then more recently, a uh, group of scholars um, inspired by and including uh, Federico Rousseau and John Williamson have developed what I call now the both and approach and RWT stands for the Rousseau-Williamson thesis which is the framework for, for this approach. Um, and then I want to suggest that all of these uh, three, EDM itself and then the either or and the both and approaches are actually addressing two questions. I want them to change the question slightly and then propose a solution for it. Um, which involves integration using difference mechanisms, which I hope will make more sense by the end of the talk. So, evidence-based medicine and mechanisms. So I probably should have called this slide a hierarchy of evidence, given all of the discussion that we've had um, this weekend about the different forms of the hierarchy, the way that different are that there's dozens or even a couple hundred of them. Um, the one that I'm using is the one that was developed by the Evidence-Based Medicine Working Group, so the originators of the term EBM and one of the main um, originators of the overall approach. And there's a few reasons that I do this. First of all, it's fairly straightforward, um, so I, I know that a lot of people who developed this have gone on to work on a great project where they're um, much more subtle and there's some blurry between the layers. But really, it's, this is a, a pretty straightforward way of looking at things. It's also fairly accurate. So all of the hierarchies tend to have this in common. Um, also, I like to rely on the EBM working group's work in general for a couple of reasons. First of all, that they've written enough about not just the hierarchy, but also how they see EBM working, that it's possible to call together a fairly um, coherent picture of what they say that CABM is. And then the other reason is that I'm from Hamilton, Ontario, home of McMaster University, so I got a little hometown pride really. So this version of the hierarchy, again, which I think is, is representative, um, puts population level research from uh, randomized control trials and non-randomized trials, which is case control studies, uh, to the top level of the hierarchy. I know there's been a lot of discussion about the relationships of learning levels, but uh, again, the what holds these together is the idea that the best evidence comes from um, clinical research done in large numbers of people. Uh, in the case of treatment studies, this is a hierarchy of treatment, um, the group getting the experimental intervention is compared with a group that gets a uh, control intervention. So all of these basically are variations on a fairly similar approach. And they contrast, at least for the purposes of this talk, with what this hierarchy calls physiologic studies, which philosophers tend to think of or discuss in terms of mechanisms. Uh, it's really the relationship between these top levels and this lower level that I'm concerned with here. So if you look at what the EBM folks say, you can identify two distinct questions that they're answering when they talk about the relationship between population level clinical research and physiological research. 
The first one is, um, can knowledge of mechanisms ever justify the claim that a treatment will be effective in general? So can uh, physiological reasoning ever give us the kind of evidence that the gold standard randomized trial is supposed to give us? And the answer to that question is no, but I put a question mark after that. Um, and the reason is that what they actually say is, what you need to do is look for the evidence from the highest possible level of the hierarchy. So if there's none of this research, you're stuck using physiological studies. Uh, second, can knowledge of mechanisms ever justify the claim that a treatment will be effective to any particular patient? So this is a general claim looking at populations. This is um, the application of clinical trial results to a particular patient. And the answer to this question for the EBM folks is um, definitely that yes. So I'm going backwards instead of forwards. There we go. Um, some evidence that their answer to question one is a no. This is from a paper by David Sackett, so a core member of the EBM working group, who in 2001 argued for the shift from bench research, physiological research, to what he called clinical practice research, so the more um, epidemiology-informed research. And he says, millions of dollars worth of bench research that appeared to show a reduction in atherosclerosis-related <coughs> oxidative stress with vitamin E therapy was recently tested in an RCT that asked the vital question, does the vitamin E therapy endorsed by this research really help prevent heart disease? The answer was a resounding no. And we see this a lot in discussions of evidence-based medicine. They like to point to cases where physiological uh, reasoning pointed toward a, the use of a particular treatment, um, and then uh, randomized controlled trial came along and gave us the truth about the situation. Similarly, throughout the writings of the EBM working group, you get a lot of warnings to be wary of what they call pathophysiologic rationale. So the user's guides to the medical literature, which is a collection of um, articles originally published in JAMA, suggests that a good reason for being weary of physiological reasoning is that the human mind is sufficiently fertile that there is no shortage of biologically plausible explanations or indirect evidence in support of almost any observations. And I just want to point out that the context for this is a section of the chapter that's entitled When to Believe a Subgroup Analysis. That's actually going to become relevant later in the talk. But here we get the idea that we can basically make up biological um, explanations that seem plausible based on the evidence that we have, but that they're not a good ground for making um, treatment uh, claims, tra claims about treatment efficacy. So all of that pertains to question one, when can we make general claims about when a therapy is going to be effective? Question two, however, relies really heavily on the use of reasoning health mechanisms. So uh, this is a long quote from the EBM Working Group's 1992 manifesto in which they um, introduce evidence-based medicine to a broader clinical audience. They say, a sound understanding of pathophysiology is necessary to interpret and apply the results of clinical research. For instance, most patients to whom we would like to generalize the results of randomized trials would not, for what, or sorry, would, for one reason or another, not have been enrolled in a <coughs> study. Understanding the pathophysiology allows the clinician to better judge whether the results are applicable to the patient at hand. Second, and this is again from the user's guides, what they say should be done is take the results of your clinical study, your RCT, or your meta-analysis, and don't worry so much about whether your patient would have uh, qualified to be in the trial. So instead of rigidly applying a study's inclusion and exclusion criteria, they say that clinicians should ask themselves whether there's some compelling reason that the result should not uh, be applied to the patient. A compelling reason usually will not be found, and often you can generalize the results to the patient with confidence. So I just want to point out here that what we're doing is on page 71, saying that, hey, you know, we've got enough knowledge of pathophysiology that we can take the results of a clinical trial and apply them to a patient who would not have qualified to be in the trial. And then 500 pages later, they're warning us that we are sufficiently good at making shit up that we can uh, justify doing just about everything. And I like including this quote in talks because it really makes me angry. Um, and the reason is that 
the patients who would not have qualified to be in a clinical trial didn't meet the inclusion criteria precisely because there was something about them that made the designers of the trial think that the drug would not work in them the way that it's intended to work in the study population. So they were excluded for a reason in the context of a clinical trial. These reasons are really important. They're, they're a huge part of trial design. But uh, EDM is just ignoring this in clinical practice. And I think that this is irresponsible. And I also think that it's contrary to the spirit of EDM because essentially they're saying, well, we can't think of any good reason not to do this. We don't have any evidence not to do it. And for a movement that is pushing the use of solid evidence. Rent over. <laughs> so, what I want to suggest next is that the way that the question of the relationship between epidemiological uh, population level research on the one hand and physiological bench research on the other um, has been taken up by philosophers has been shaped by these two questions that I've just answered in the context of the EBM uh, group's writings. Um, and again, I, I think that Halleck and Anderson take what I'm calling the either-or approach. They end up asking exactly the questions that um, the EBM folks ask. Can we use either clinical research or research from mechanisms? And I'll talk a bit more about that next. So again, we have exactly the same questions that we started with. Can knowledge of mechanisms ever justify a general claim that a treatment is effective? Can knowledge of mechanisms ever justify the claim that a treatment will be effective in a particular patient? And Jeremy Halleck, surprisingly, gives exactly the opposite answers to the EBM folks. So the EBM folks say no to this question and yes to this question, um, same as Anderson does. Halleck, who's very pro-EBM, actually says yes to the general claim question and then no to the extrapolation question. So uh, we saw some of this yesterday, I think it was in David's talk, uh, how it talks about what he calls high quality mechanistic reasoning, which he says, first of all, must not be incomplete. So we must have sort of the complete causal story of the mechanism. We have to take into account knowledge of other mechanisms that might get triggered by the intervention and either produce undesirable side effects or even paradoxical effects. So worsening something that um, treatment is supposed to improve, and we must also recognize the probabilistic nature of mechanisms. But even though Halleck says, yes, we can make these kinds of claims, he acknowledges that these circumstances are unusual. So one of his um, <coughs> big examples is um, radio <coughs> he talks about how we have a, a fair amount of knowledge of this mechanism. There's really no knowledge of um, potentially conflicting mechanisms that might um, get in the way of producing the effect that we want. And the mechanism is, is pretty robust, so there's a good probability that application of the treatment will result in the outcome that we want. Anderson, however, picks apart this uh, argument, focusing mostly on this. She talks about how we can't be sure, even when we know quite a bit of mechanisms, that there aren't going to be other mechanisms that um, will interfere. So she gives an example of um, giving prophylactic acetaminophen, paracetamol, in infants when they're about to be immunized, because um, they, they will often run a fever after receiving the immunization. So the idea is that giving them uh, the paracetamol will uh, prevent the fever and not interfere with the process of immunization. And it turns out that that's actually not true, even though we know quite a bit about those mechanisms independently, she says that we could not have predicted that there would be this interaction so that the uh, prophylactic treatment interfered with the um, immunization response. So again, question one, focusing mostly on how it, but I think Anderson's argument against this is pretty compelling. Anderson actually agrees with the EDM folks as well about question two, which is whether you can, in the case of an individual patient, use knowledge of mechanisms to extrapolate from the results of a clinical trial. And she says that yes, you can do this, but her answer is, is pretty grudging. She basically says, look, most of the time this is going to be the only game in town. We have these clinical trials, we don't have much information about how this patient, who presumably would not have qualified to be in the trial, 
will respond to people. So we have to do the best we can, which will involve reasoning about mechanisms. So she says that reasoning about uh, physiology to apply the results of a trial to an individual patient is the best available me method of reasoning. <laughs> Simply put, it may be suboptimal, but there is no better alternative at this stage. So here the italics are hers and the bold is mine. So she agrees with the EBM folks, but she's much more, um, she has much stronger reservations. Because remember, the EBM guys were all like, we can totally do this with confidence. And she's like, well, you know, we really can't, but what other choice do we have? Um, I've actually written a bit more about this in a paper from, I think, 2013 in the Journal of Evaluation and Clinical Practice. I don't want to say too much more. I wanted mostly to talk about this to set up the either-or approach. I mostly agree with past Robin. I think I underestimated the extent to which Anderson really is, um, has strong reservations about her yes to question two. Um, but by and large, I think that is the either-or approach. And actually reading this, I, I noticed that the final line of my abstract is basically saying that we should do what I think I'm going to be able to start doing in the second half of this talk. So, so far we have EBM setting up the two questions. We have Howick and then Anderson taking up the two questions, looking at the issue of whether we can use either population level research from clinical trials or non-randomized studies, or knowledge of mechanisms, either for general claims or for claims about particular patients. I'm going to move on then to the next group that has um, addressed these questions. And this is what I'm, I'm calling the both end approach. Because whereas the EBM folks in Hawking and Anderson want to say, well, which one do we get to rely on? Um, the Russo Williamson thesis is precisely that we always need both. So I'm going to be talking mostly here about a paper in 2014 by Russo Williamson and some of their colleagues. The lead author was Brendan Clark. So Clark et al. Um, described the RWT in this paper um, by saying, in order to establish that A is the cause of B in medicine, one normally needs to establish two things. First, that A and B are probabilistically dependent, so this is what you get from the clinical research and populations, conditional on B's other known causes. Second, that there is some underlying mechanism linking A and B that can account for the difference that A makes to B. So this is where the mechanisms come in. And again, their whole point is that you need both of these kinds of So if we're looking at the hierarchy of evidence, and I had started by saying that this is the sort of primary form of evidence for EBM, the question is what to do about this level, and the either-or approach basically plays off this against this, RWT says, well, we need all of it. And in the 2014 paper, there's this nice figure that talks about um, evidence of mechanisms being treated alongside of evidence of correlation. <laughs> So what we get here is evidence of correlation from the population level clinical trials and evidence of mechanisms from bench research, from physiological research. There's some influence of knowledge of mechanisms in assessing correlational evidence. So for example, one of the reasons that people were reluctant to believe in homeopathy, uh, despite the fact that for a while there were some clinical trials that made it look very promising, is that there's just no plausible mechanism at all. Um, uh, and similarly, then we can take evidence of correlation into account when we're rating mechanistic evidence. If we think that A causes B, uh, but we don't see any relationship between A and B out there in the real world, we don't need to rethink what we um, are, are doing with our mechanisms. And again, the key thing is that you need both the evidence of correlation and the evidence of mechanisms to make claims about whether A is the cause of B. And they talk about whether A is the cause of B here. So I'm going to just take this to mean the um, general question about whether we can use knowledge of mechanisms to make general claims about the efficacy of treatment. And again, their answer is yes, but we also need evidence of correlation, hand in hand, both together. And then A is a cause of B in this patient, and A is a cause of B there, where there is relevantly different to here. I'm going to sort of lump these together, but mostly focus on um, the generalization to a particular patient, because that fits with my question too. So, what do, uh, what does RWT actually say about mechanisms? 
I'm going to say more about this in a little bit. They basically gave a fairly standard account of mechanisms. So there's a huge literature now in the philosophy of science on mechanisms. The idea is that um, biologists don't tend to discover laws, so um, mechanisms are really the primary form of explanation in biology. <laughs> Again, huge literature on figuring out exactly what a mechanism is and how it works. Um, in the Clark et al. paper, they quote uh, the earlier paper by Elaine and Williamson, who say that a mechanism for a phenomenon consists of entities and activities organized in such a way that they're responsible for the phenomenon. Um, and I will show later that this matches up with probably the uh, most famous uh, in local circles um, definition of mechanism in the philosophy of science literature, so the Macomer, Darwin, and Kramer account. What's not standard? is where uh, RWT thinks about mechanisms as actually coming from. So in this same paper, they say evidence of mechanisms can come from laboratory studies, from literature reviews specifically of lab studies, from case studies, textbook consensus, expert testimony, all kinds of things that don't really fit neatly into this idea that it's entities and activities and really focusing on uh, the nitty gritty biological details in a lab somewhere. And I've added to this um, clinical research showing probabilistic dependence also for this group provides evidence of mechanism. They don't say this here, and I could not find it when I was looking, but I'm pretty sure they make the explicit claim, so thank you, I thought so. Um, but as I'll show, it's implicit even in this paper where they don't come right out and say it. So again, back to our two questions. Can knowledge of mechanisms ever justify the claim that a treatment will be effective in general, can knowledge of mechanisms ever justify the claim that a treatment will be effective in this particular patient? And in both cases, the answer coming from the RWT framework is that you need both kinds of evidence for each. I want to work really quickly just through one example that they gave about general causal claims because I think it's not problematic. Um, so in the early days of trying to find treatments for tuberculosis, people were using streptomycin. It seemed to be effective, but over time, patients who seemed to be cured at first would relapse because the researchers had knowledge of drug resistance in bacteria, which is a mechanistic physiological process. They redid <coughs> some studies with a combination therapy that aimed to overcome this um, drug resistance, and this combination therapy ended up being really successful. So again, yeah, knowledge of mechanisms allowed researchers to develop a better um, hypothesis about what kind of therapy might work, which then was tested in a randomized trial. Where I think things get messier for this paper is uh, claims about generalizability to a particular patient. So the example that they work through in the biggest detail, the biggest detail here is the 2011 NICE guidelines for treating hypertension. And what they say is that there were a number of randomized trials that were done showing outcome differences in different subgroups of patients, and that these RCTs informed the development of the guidelines, and that the RCTs were themselves informed by evidence that the mechanism of hypertension differs in these different subgroups. But I think that's too fast. So after presenting the guidelines in general, they focus on this one paper by, and I'm going to totally butcher this poor man's name, Kershagar, sure, sure, sure. okay. K et al, <laughs> who um, they describe, uh, Clark et al describe on page um, 347 as uh, showing that risk of cardiovascular disease differs in different age and racial and ethnic groups, and that's exactly correct. But then two pages later, they say, subgroup analysis showed different treatment responses in different groups. And the way that they say this is a little confusing, so I have pulled the quote. They say, um, and again, referring to the specific paper, groups of subjects belonging to particular ethnic groups or of particular ages were analyzed separately on the grounds that evidence of mechanism provided good reasons to suspect that these groups would respond differently to the drug under test rather differently from each other. And if this is referring to the use of K et al. in the context of the NICE guidelines, I think that's not an unreasonable thing to say, but it actually isn't supported by looking just at the study on its own because the study in the treatment study, and it's not conducted in patients with hypertension. Specifically, it is a large cohort study 
that looks at blood pressure that is below levels of hypertension. So they um, talk about high, um, high blood pressure and then high normal, and I forget what the group right below that was caused, but essentially um, the people in this study did not meet clinical criteria for hypertension. And what they found, and again, this is reflected in, uh, I don't even know what this point. In this description, the risk of cardiovascular disease differs. So what happened is in older people and in blacks, people in these high normal and even lower than high normal um, groups um, with regard to blood pressure were more likely to um, have cardiovascular disease as they were followed over time. So again, I think how much this is a problem uh, depends on the extent to which um, the extent to which we're thinking about this as being something that informed the guidelines in conjunction with a bunch of other evidence or an analysis of that study in particular that it played. But I think the big problem is that this study doesn't actually mention mechanisms. So it does, in justifying the cohort study that they were um, conducting, talk about previous evidence that suggests that there's different risk of cardiovascular disease in these groups, but all of this, um, the studies that they talk about are cohort studies as well. So there's no mechanistic explanation of why hypertension or high normal blood pressure is more likely to result in cardiovascular disease in these groups. And again, I'm not sure that this is really a problem for the RWT approach because they define mechanisms so broadly or they define evidence for mechanisms so broadly. And um, again, I think there's probably people in this room that can give a better answer to this than I can, but I think that the rationale behind casting such a wide net for evidence of mechanisms is that it feeds into the project that um, Daniel is in charge of, of um, grading evidence for mechanisms. So if we just look at everything that could conceivably, evidence, conceivably be evidence for mechanisms and then sort out what's good and what's not so good, that's actually a really reasonable strategy to take. But I think it does sit oddly with the idea that what we're looking for when we talk about mechanisms is specific entities and activities that are organized in such a way that they're responsible for the film. Um, when we talk about um, mechanistic explanations in the philosophy of science, we're talking about isolating these identities, uh, isolating these entities, take a sort of coffee before this gets worse. We're talking about isolating these entities figuring out what they do that produces the phenomenon that we're interested in. And again, this is really similar to the MDC account of mechanisms, the McMurder and Craver paper that really, I think, jump-started the interest in mechanisms in philosophy of medicine. So they also say mechanisms are entities and activities, and that these entities and activities are organized such that they are productive of regular changes from start or setup to finish or termination conditions. And then they move from the definition of a mechanism to a description to a, an account of what scientists are trying to do when they isolate these mechanisms. They show, when they're giving a description of the mechanisms, how the termination conditions, so the output of the mechanism, uh, are produced by the setup conditions at each of these stages. So that's a lot to take in. And uh, again, there's, there's been this whole cottage industry trying to figure out what this means and how it works and how adequate this definition is and how tweaking the definition might make some differences. So I thought I'd just use my bad PowerPoint skills to give us a really clear understanding of what is involved in a mechanism. So these are entities. And the entities each engage in an activity. And when the initial condition the input, which is going to be me pressing a button, assuming I can press the right one this time, uh, occurs, it triggers each entity to engage in its characteristic activity, which will result in the characteristic output of the mechanism. So here's how this goes. And we're done. So again, what I think is that if we look at the RWT approach, it's doing something really important by taking this both and approach, talking about how um, information about mechanisms 
is necessary in clinical research and how um, information about correlation is necessary for us to really understand what's going on with mechanisms. They're moving us beyond this sort of stale either or dichotomy um, and trying to develop an approach that will actually be descriptively true and probably result in actually better research. But I think that the way the approach has been developed so far works better for general causal claims than for claims related to variability and generalizability. Um, I also want to point out that, again, there's an acceptance of the consensus characterization of a mechanism, but that what counts as evidence for mechanisms is much broader than I think how I go to EBM people or um, Anderson would, would be willing to count this. So that was part one. What I think we should do is actually move away from these two questions that I've been talking about and ask a relevantly different question, which is, instead of, can knowledge of physiological mechanisms be used? Instead of, or alongside of, epidemiological knowledge, what we really should be asking is, how can our knowledge of physiological mechanisms be better incorporated into clinical research? So what is it that we know about mechanisms that can actually allow better research at the level of population um, outcome studies? And to start trying to think about how this might work, I want to just remind you of the RBC account, the MDC account. Mechanisms are entities and activities organized in such a way that they're productive of regular changes. If you have the right startup conditions and the entities are able to do their thing, you get an um, appropriate termination condition. But I think that there's something missing here in that there's, when we're talking about mechanisms in the context of medicine, by definition we're talking about situations in which we think that the mechanisms just aren't functioning properly. There's something wrong with the setup conditions for an initial mechanism. Uh, there's something wrong with the entities, they're unable to engage in their activities, and as a result, we don't get the normal termination conditions. And I want to look to work by James Tabory to flesh out why this is a problem and how we might be able to get around it. So Tabory is actually a philosopher of biology. He's interested in bridging population level accounts in evolutionary theory with genetic accounts. So the analog mechanism. And he points out in a 2009 paper that the existing philosophy of, me of mechanism, so the MDC account and everything that's come from that, with its focus on regularity and experimental intervention, is not designed to capture the explanation of variation. And he has this really nice thing where he's talking about Carl Craver's work on spatial memory in the rat. And he says that the mechanism that comes out of this kind of explanation is true for the platonic form of the rat, but it's not really true for any rat that actually exists. So some rats have better or worse spatial memory. Um, they're um, variable in the extent to which they can learn and can navigate these mazes. And that the existing philosophy of mechanism, because it's um, sort of abstracting from all of this variability, is not really able to account for that. And I think this is actually a really great way of thinking about mechanisms in the context of philosophy of medicine. So what Tabor suggests instead is that we talk about difference mechanisms. So he says difference mechanisms are regular causal mechanisms made up of difference-making variables, one or more of which are actual difference makers in Kenneth Waters' use of the term. So I have an animation for that too in just a minute. Um, but I want to just say that what Tabory thinks we can do is address variation by looking at these difference-making variables, seeing what values those variables take in the real world, and how those variables, or those different values of the variables, lead to different outcomes. So in his research, um, given his interest, the difference-making variables would be um, different alleles. And the... Um, differences in the world would be phenotypic differences. So how does this work? Well, we have here our mechanism again. And I want to just draw your attention to this entity, and I'm going to run this again because I'm super proud of it. So watch 
purple entity doing its thing. All right? And then here's a variation on that mechanism. There's something wrong with the purple entity. It's a little pale and pink. And because of that, it does something different, and we get a different outcome. So I think that this is actually a really useful way to think about mechanisms in the context of um, medical research. And I'm going to offer some ideas as to why. First of all, as Tabor points out, difference mechanisms explain regularity and they explain variability. So for any given value of a variable, there's a regular outcome. But for different values, there are different regular outcomes. And if we look at the mechanism as a whole and the variations of the mechanism, we can link the differences in the entities or the activities within the mechanism that uh, lead to these different mechanisms to different outcomes. So how does this relate to clinical research? Well, there's a whole bunch of possible difference makers that people talk about in the context of clinical research. Sex, age, race or ethnicity, presence of comorbid conditions, taking other medications, environmental factors, genetics. Interestingly, almost none of these are physiological variables, which I will talk about a bit more uh, in general. But I, I, I think we're right when we think about these as being possible difference makers because they do point to potentially important physiological differences. So if the problem that we're facing is one of understanding variability in treatment outcomes, uh, we're wanting to predict how the application of a particular treatment in different subgroups of patients um, will result in different, so the application of a treatment in different subgroups of patients will result in different outcomes, we get a partial solution when we define subgroups by their demographic or their clinical characteristics. But I want to say that we actually need more than that. In at least some cases, we're going to need to define those subgroups, not just by demographic or clinical characteristics, but by difference mechanisms. And the reason for that um, is that, first of all, demographic or clinical factors don't actually cause physiological, uh, sorry, don't actually cause physiological variability. Other physiological factors do. And I'm going to walk through that a little bit using work by uh, Kenneth Rothman on confounding. Um, and we can only identify these physiological factors if we do research on mechanisms. And I think that we need not to stop at the level of clinical or demographic factors for reasons that my colleague Sean Bias has talked about, I think, pretty convincingly. Um, so he, in a discussion of public health interventions, has said that um, one of the problems with public health research and public health programs or campaigns is that the designers of these efforts have often downplayed the scope of the claims that they're making. So they make some pretty broad statements. Specifically, his interest is in um, racial groups that complicate claims that they're at risk of um, elevated risk for particular diseases. Uh, so he actually talks about the question of hypertension in black Americans as well. And he says, well, look, the risk is going to be different for people who are U.S. born versus people who are immigrants. And I mean, you could probably um, find plenty of research that suggests that there's dietary and other lifestyle factors that are relevant here. But again, Sean's worry is that if we go with the simple message, we're missing out on a lot of important complexity. Uh, he also talks about cystic fibrosis being much more common in Caucasians than other groups. But an exception to that is people who are of Finnish descent. So I think this gives us good reason to be wary of stopping at the level of um, clinical or demographic um, characteristics. But going back to the idea that it's actually the physiological vari variability underlying these demographic or clinical factors that makes a difference, I want to turn to um, Kenneth Rothman's work. So this is actually his um, introductory textbook on epidemiology, and I think it's just a really nice, clear example of what's going on. So this is a graph from a 1966 paper by Stark and Mantel, looking at the way that risk of Down syndrome varies with uh, birth order. So it turns out that oldest children tend not to have Down syndrome very often. Um, second children have slightly higher risk, and so on. By the time you get to be the um, fifth or higher uh, birth in your family, um, and my mom is the second youngest of 13, 
So <laughs> presumably her risk would have been really big. She's fine. Um, but by the time you are the fifth or, or um, highest birth or higher birth in your family, you have a much higher risk of Down syndrome. And it could actually have been that there's a physiological explanation underlying this. So if you think about something like erythroblastosis fetalis, which I think I said correctly and I still have coffee, um, there's good physiological reasons or explanations for why children who are born uh, later are at greater risk of this disease. But in the case of Down syndrome, that's not true. And in fact, what happens is we recognize that the risk of birth, um, of increasing risk of Down syndrome with birth order is actually masking the more important issue, which is maternal age. Because by the time a woman has had her fifth or her 11th or 12th child, she's older than when she had her first child. So here we've got um, the uh, effect of maternal age. And as you can see, the um, effect of maternal age is a much stronger, thank you, um, <coughs> a much stronger effect, uh, much um, greater causal risk factor for Down syndrome than birth order. But then Rothman goes on to say something that I think is really important, which is that maternal age itself serves as a proxy for as yet unidentified events that more directly account for the occurrence of Down syndrome. When these events are identified, we would ultimately find that the mother's age has no effect once we take into account the biological changes that are correlated with age. So we can remove the apparent effect of maternal age by just focusing on these underlying biological changes. So he says, as the layers of confounding are left behind, we gradually approach a deeper causal understanding of the underlying biology. And essentially, that's what I think mechanism, mechanistic research should be doing in the context of clinical research. So what we are wanting to do, what I think we should be doing, um, is identifying relevant variables of potential difference makers, so different physiological characteristics that we think we might affect a particular outcome of interest, and then do clinical research at a population level where um, these variables are measured in trial participants, and then subgroup analyses are conducted on the basis of these physiological markers. And if differences are found between these subgroups, the variable would be considered to be an actual difference maker. And I'm already anticipating some of the questions that are going to some of the issues that are going to be raised in the question period. I think I'm ready for them, um, but I recognize that there's a lot packed into this slide that needs a lot more to that, so I'm getting here. So I have a giant caveat, which is that in some cases, clinical or demographic factors are going to be enough. We don't always need a physiological marker to make a good prediction. Um, I think that this is more likely to occur in cases where the prediction has to do with um, things like socioeconomic status, where there's just a really strong effect on health that has a whole nest of physiological factors underlying it, and where the appropriate level of intervention is probably going to be at a, socio uh, at a social program level rather than uh, a medical treatment level. I also think that if we're talking about predicting the potential for harm, we might not want to think too deeply. We might just want to recognize that certain groups are at greater risk when they're doing particular treatments. Um, Anderson's example from her 2012 paper that I was talking about earlier is a really nice example of this. So she, in talking about extrapolation, talks about a patient who has, I think it's both, <coughs> excuse me, breast cancer and type 2 diabetes. And one of the treatments that her physician is considering um, does not work as well in patients treating breast cancer. She really loads this um, example so that it fits the, the point she wants to make. There's multiple treatments available. They're all roughly equally effective. And there's clear evidence of harm associated with one treatment. And in that case, I don't think we need to care what the physiological basis for the harm is. We don't need to dig any deeper. I also have a small caveat, which is that this approach that I'm sketching out won't work for rare conditions. So um, thinking about precision medicine, which we've heard about from Mark and from David, they're really focusing on um, issues or cases where we have unusual variants that we can identify physiologically, um, but where the kind of integration of clinical research <coughs> that I'm advocating for isn't going to help. So I'm really more worried about things like chronic diseases that are fairly common. And I've got a bit of hand waving. 
which is, I think, always a really nice way to end a talk, because um, then I get to pick your dreams and see if I can actually make something happen um, from this. So I started the talk by identifying two questions that the user's guides are, are interested in when they talk about mechanisms, uh, the general claims about efficacy, the extrapolation of particular patients, but they actually address a third question, which is issues related to the use of so-called surrogate of endpoints. So um, these are physiological measures that are um, supposed to be predictive of or markers for clinically important outcomes. And I think the EBM folks are justifiably wary of these because, for example, you could have a drug that does do a great job of lowering cholesterol, but does absolutely nothing to prevent cardiovascular disease. And if we just look at the surrogate endpoint, then the drug looks actually be much more clinically useful than it is. Um, so I think that the approach that I'm advocating can actually say something about when a physiological variable can legitimately be used as a surrogate endpoint, but I'm still trying to think a bit about that. Um, and the EBM folks say, <coughs> in this discussion that a surrogate outcome will be consistently reliable only if there's a causal connection between change in surrogate and change in the clinically important outcome. So if this, the way this drug lowers cholesterol does actually lower the risk of the heart disease. Um, thus the surrogate must be in the causal pathway of the disease and an intervention's entire effect on the clinical outcome interest should be fully captured by a change in the surrogate endpoint. I think this quote's just really interesting because here more than anywhere else I've seen the APM folks are actually sounding like philosophers of science. You know, when they talk about things like causal pathways and capturing the full effect of something. Um, so this is something I'm still kind of trying to pick apart, so this is where the hand waiting ends. And I'm going to close with the too long didn't read version of the talk. I think that clinical researchers need to do a better job of doing subgroup analyses and that knowledge of physiological variability can help with that. Thank you.